All right, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, yeah, so I have great pleasure of meeting several people uh, today and lots and lots of conversations on a wide range of topics. This is going to be a talk on a wide range of topics. Um, I hope that everyone will find something that they find interesting and I, I hope that I can do each one justice. Uh, I may skip one at the end depending on how we're doing for time. The one, if I do, I'll be skipping the one that is the reason for the, the background picture here, which is, uh, this is a picture of lava crystallizing in our lab. It's a platinum crucible. The field of view is about two inches across. And the interesting thing here is that the crystals, the obvious big yellow blobs, well, you all know if it's yellow, it's hotter than something that is orange. So how are the crystals hotter than the lava that they are crystallizing from? Anyway, hopefully we'll have time to come back and address that at the end. So yeah, um, I moved to UTSA just over four years ago and set up the, the hamster lab. That's a logo in the top left. Um, and um, yeah, it took nearly as much time to figure out you know, a good acronym and a logo as it did to do anything else in the lab. Um, anyway, but uh, these are some of the current and former members. And so, yeah. If their if their degree is in parentheses, they're still working on it. So anyway, there's several of them, uh, and a couple of them uh, from the uh, University of Missouri, because you know it was uh, it was an interesting process transferring over. Um, and then of course the work I'm going to show is obviously collaborative with many many students and, and, and a couple of postdocs, but also uh, several colleagues, including uh, Kenny Beefus um, and some others that you may know. All right, so what is, the, what is the point of my presentation? It's really that since I kind of got into planetary geology, I should point out, especially for the students, I did my PhD in Himalayan tectonics, right? So uh, doing a mixture of like geochemistry, uh, petrology, a little bit of structural geology, not as much as I wanted to, anyway. Um, so what, how do they get first of all into volcanoes and then into planetary geology? And I found interests and, and went in that direction. So just to say that whatever you do for your degree, I hopefully you'll love it and enjoy it, but you absolutely have the option to branch out into other things later on. All right, so most of you, I hope, had a petrology class. And so you'll have learned in igneous petrology that you, know, you start, maybe you, maybe you started with the mantle and you learned about partial melting. And then you made a basalt, probably at about 1300 C. And then that basalt cooled and crystallized. And you ended up probably with a residual melt that was more silica rich, but then that crystallized as well. I think you made some pyroxenes and some feldspars. And then, you know, by 1000 C, everything was done, right? So igneous petrology fit in 300 degrees. And then hopefully you learned about granites and found that, oh, it went all the way down to 650 degrees C if it was a water-saturated granite. But there's so much more than that. So on the right is the, uh, the kind of uh, total alkali silica diagram, which is with three compositions. I'll show you some data from each of those three things, but they kind of bracket uh, the, the ranges of terrestrial lava compositions. On the left is a phase diagram, a very simple phase diagram, the best kind. Um, but what we're used to learning about in igneous petrology is this part, from the liquidus to the solidus, right? Where real rocks that are many components, they don't just all melt at one temperature, we have this, this melting range. But it's bracketed by the liquidus and the solidus. And we don't usually go hotter than this, and we don't usually go cooler than that. And I'm here to expand your horizons a little bit, if they haven't already been expanded. Um, because it turns out you can have lavas that are way hotter than their liquidus temperature. They are superheated. Um, and one way of doing that is by uh, a, an impact, to produce an impact melt, uh, which can cool hundreds of degrees before it starts to crystallize. If you have a lava like an obsidian, right, a volcanic, uh, well, as a rock, it's a volcanic glass, but when it's hot, it's a volcanic liquid that just refuses to crystallize. Um, and so it ends up solidifying by going through the glass transition, which just simply goes from liquid to glass, right? So this is a kind of a disequilibrium phase diagram on the right. This is what we're used to. This is what we learn in class on the left. 
because we can apply thermodynamics under equilibrium conditions, we can make predictions. Um, this is disequilibrium world, um, which it has some exciting consequences, um, which hopefully we'll get to at the end. All right, and I'm also going to expand the range of compositions we look at, um, including, uh, most obviously, we'll talk a bit about cryolavas. So here's an approximate outline, which may adapt depending on how much I talk. Um, so uh, we'll start with looking at uh, kind of a high viscosity limit, so um, obsidian and, and silicic lava flows on Earth, but with a kind of teaser trailer for uh, one of my PhD students' projects that maybe these things are also found on other planets in the solar system. Case study two, we'll go to the low viscosity end and we'll talk about cryolavas. Um, I mean, on Europa, but obviously we're doing them in the lab, so, you know, it could be anywhere. Um, and then we'll start talking about just the weird compositions, and if we have time, we'll slip in the salts behaving badly. Um, and I promise you that last section is one slide only. So, right. Okay, so again, things you probably learned in school. Uh, so, you know, we have silicic lavas that are lower temperature, high silica content, therefore the melt is polymerized, right? So melts and crystals, the main difference between them is that the crystals have really good short range order and really good long range order. Whereas the melts only have good short range order, they're still made of silica tetrahedra, but the long range order isn't there. They're kind of isotropic on a, uh, on a large scale. All right, so we have um, basalt, silica pore, crystal pore, high temperature, very fluid. There's some nice pohoihoi lava from Hawaii. On the right, we have a silica-rich, crystal-rich, cooler lava at Santiaguito in Guatemala that is busy exploding right there. All right, so composition and temperature are important. There's a third factor that's important as well. So this is a really great diagram published by... Don Dingwell, now in more than 25 years ago. Um, on the left, we have things that are liquid and will flow. And on the right, we have things that are glassy and will break. And temperature, hot on the left, cold on the right. Okay, hot, more fluid. That all makes sense. But the y-axis on here is really important. We have time scale. So you can have something that would deform in a brittle way if you were to deform it quickly, but would be ductile if you were to deform it slowly. Have any of you ever hit silly putty with a hammer? I recommend it. Uh, not if you have to clean up the room afterwards. It, it makes, it's surprisingly messy. But yeah, I used to do this as a, as a demonstration in intro geology classes, and everyone would wake up, when the, at least when the hammer hit the ground. It's pretty noisy. Uh, but yeah, if you hit silly putty hard enough, you have to really hit it like you mean it it will absolutely shatter, and you'll see lots of kind of brittle fractures in it. Um, whereas the rest of the time, you know, we know silly putty is good for showing ductile deformation, you can roll it, and of course you can bounce it, and also deforms elastically. All right, so then volcanic behavior, explosive versus effusive, we've got kind of temperature and composition that often go together, but we also have deformation rate. And in volcanoes, what this really means or really relates to is the ascent velocity uh, or uh, the mass discharge rate, just how much, how fast is stuff coming out of the ground. Which means that if you have a basalt, you can form lava flows. You can also form lava fountains, right, which is actually breaking up into little particles there. Um, both of those are relatively um, low energy eruptions. And then um, for effusive, um, oh, sorry, for, for silicic lavas that are much more viscous um, and sticky. You can have an explosive Plinian eruption uh, if there's a high mass discharge rate, but if things kind of seep out of the ground slowly, you can form lava domes. So Mount St. Helens and two different modes of, of eruption right there. All right, it's much more effective to actually show you video than to talk about this. So sorry for the shaky hands, but these were all uh, recorded in the field, so usually in pretty windy conditions. This is a lava flow on Pacaya in Guatemala. That right there, that thing, is a, is a boulder, a, a rafted boulder that is being carried on top of the lava flow. So another thing to remember, um, right, how many of you have seen the film Volcano, Tommy Lee Jones? The coast is toast. Okay, a few of you. All right, so there's a famous scene in Volcano, spoiler alert, um, someone falls 
into some lava. Um, but you don't fall into lava, you fall onto lava, right? It is much denser than you are, so just something to remember. Anyway, if you've learned nothing else today, there's one useful thing. All right, um, so here's lava uh, in, in Guatemala, um, uh, rafting this, this boulder, nice fluid lava flow. Um, here is the toe of a lava flow in Hawaii. That is our entire drinking water supply for the day. And we're like five miles from the truck, anyway. Um, so that's my former student, Alex, sampling with the hammer. Um, all right, so here we get this nice thin pahoy hoy texture. This lava flow in, in Guatemala, this is the end of the same flow. Um, and you can see it's, this is not moving very fast at all. And it moves by just like the crust falling off and bits oozing out, but we've already turned into an ah uh -uh lava flow. Um, some of the bits that were falling off here, here's one uh, that I kind of rolled out of the way and then rather unwisely stood on it while I hammered it open. And you can see it's brittle, right? It's breaking, but it's still red hot on the inside. Um, so another thing to bear in mind here is just how hot lava has to be in order to be fluid. All right, so obviously I study lava rheology, right? So, oh, I didn't tell you what the hamster lab stands for. It's heat and mass transfer and experimental rheology, which is obviously far too much to say, so. All right, um, so these are two pieces of equipment that we have uh, for measuring uh, lava rheology. Uh, the high temperature one is this concentric cylinder. This is actually the initial iteration of the, of the thing from 2004 or whenever we first installed it. Um, anyway, so basically we have a spindle that goes into a cylindrical crucible. The spindle spins around and it has to work harder to spin at a certain rate if the fluid is more viscous, more sticky. And so here what you measure is the torque and the angular velocity, which translate to stress and strain rate. And viscosity is stress divided by strain rate. Hence its units are Pascal seconds. Because the units of strain, remember, are per second. And so viscosity is Pascal seconds. So uh, this one works well for uh, you know, viscosities of, uh, let's say, ketchup to peanut butter kind of range, around 100 to um, 100,000 Pascal seconds. Um, whereas the one on the left, the squashing viscometer, here we have a, a cylindrical core of, usually we're doing rock, but in this case it was glass. We heat it up above the glass transition. We are actively pushing down quite hard on this thing to make it deform at just a few microns per hour. This is very, very viscous. Um, and here we're measuring 10 to the 9 up to about 10 to the 13 Pascal seconds. Uh, and I'm not sure what the current estimate of the viscosity of the asthenosphere is, but it's usually given at something like 10 to the 19. So here we're actually closer to measuring the viscosity of the asthenosphere than we are to the viscosity of basalt. In fact, we're probably as close to the viscosity of regular upper mantle non-asthenosphere than, uh, than we are to basaltic lava. All right, so we get data that looks something like this. Uh, we tend to plot things on our Renan diagrams for various reasons. But anyway, this is log viscosity on the y-axis. The important thing to remember is this is a log scale, right? And this is one thing I love about viscosity. Usually, we don't really know the viscosity that well. Um, and if you can get it to within an order of magnitude, then we're actually doing quite well. Um, whereas, you know, tell that to an isotope geochemist, you know, when they're looking at, um, I did isotope geochemistry in my PhD, all concerned about the fifth decimal place. Uh, that's, not, that's not how things are in the world of viscosity. So it's not that the, you know, that the isotopes uh, are unimportant, they are, and you do need to measure them that precisely. I guess the good thing is, if we can measure things to plus or minus 10%, that is 0.04 log units, that's like the gold standard. Um, the certified reference materials, so these, these are actually, um, the curves there are the certified values and the points are our measurements on the certified material. Those certified reference values actually have uncertainties that are close to plus or minus half a log unit. People don't normally kind of talk about that, but anyway. Um, all right, so here's our data. So we might have, you know, we've got a bunch. This is the squishing viscometer up here, a high viscosity range. This is the stirring viscometer down here. And so the range of things we get, something like, uh, this is monocrater rhyolite, so obsidian lava from California. The circles indicate the actual eruption temperature. 
So you know, here we're looking at a viscosity of around 10 to the 10, 10 to the 9.5, something like that. So yeah, that is a trillion Pascal seconds. Um, and then for um, you know, Lackey, which is you know, a volcano in Iceland, uh, so uh, somewhere between a mid-ocean ridge and a plume, um, has a viscosity around 100 Pascal seconds. Then Naira Gongo erupts this really fluid lava, similar to Cumbre Vieja in the Canary Islands, actually, also produced very fluid lava. People are currently squabbling in the literature about exactly how fluid. Um, but um, anyway, of the order of a few tens of Pascal seconds, maybe a little runnier than ketchup. And then, of course, this is what these things look like in the field, right? This is, this is the front of Obsidian Dome. It's just a big cliff a shiny cliff of volcanic glass, and then compare that with the you know, river of fire or whatever poetic description you want for, for Naira Gongo. So just to reinforce the, the log nature of this, I think as geologists we've all spent a lot of time thinking about geologic time. Um, so here's just a simple comparison, geologic time to viscosity um, years to Pascal seconds. Um, and so those you know, Hawaiian lavas or you know, basalts erupting on, on the moon, the ones that filled the lunar mare, um, Martian lava flows are way down there, you know, approximately the range of the Apollo moon landing, something like that. Um, whereas these day sites and obsidians were going back to the equivalent of solar system formation or even the age of the universe. All right, another thing that the observant among you will have picked up on is that there is a gap in the data. Um, and the reason for that is here we're above the liquidus, right? We can stir this liquid all day long, nothing really should happen to it. Here we're so far below the glass transition, uh, sorry, so we're above the glass transition, we're so far, we're at such a low temperature that the kinetics of crystallization are really slow and we can actually keep it as a super cooled liquid, so it is a liquid, it's just not an equilibrium, right? It wants to crystallize, it just can't because the kinetics are too slow. But in the middle range, that's where it would actually crystallize. And we actually do spend a lot of time measuring the rheology of partially crystalline lava, um, but I'm just not showing it on this diagram because it, it doesn't fit the rest of the curves because those are strictly for liquids. And in fact, crystallization is really important, right? So the texture of lava is more important than its composition in determining magma viscosity. So uh, a kind of summary diagram here for this is uh, relative viscosity. This is the viscosity of a suspension relative to the viscosity of just the liquid. So this could be oil with sand in it or you know, magma, lava that is molten silicate with crystals in it, whatever you want. So if you have 60% crystals or 60% sand, then you're looking at probably about a factor of a thousand increase in the viscosity. Our current favorite model on here, by the way, is the one labeled C, but this is another thing that we, we argue about is like, which, uh, what, what's the right thing to use? But the point being that you can actually have lava rheology change by a factor of a million as it crystallizes over a relatively small temperature range. Uh, and that that can happen, in fact does happen at many volcanoes. Anytime you have a basalt that erupted at 100 pascal seconds, by the time it stopped moving, its viscosity was close to 10 to the 12 pascal seconds. So it increased 10 billion times. And so that's what I'm really fascinated in, in study, about studying, is how quickly these changes happen and whether we can, what we can tell from the morphology of the lava, what can, that can tell us about its cooling rate, uh, and so on. Uh, right, and then um, we can also do experiments in the lab where we either measure the, the uh, rheology isothermally, meaning we just leave it at one temperature, and then maybe go to another temperature and wait for it to equilibrate there, or we can do um, dynamic cooling, which it just means cooling, um, where we allow it to crystallize as well. And so here, if we were to, if we were to take the liquid and cool it very quickly so that it couldn't crystallize, it would come along here where that red arrow is and it would be, it would come through somewhere over here. It would stay pretty fluid until it approached the glass transition and then the viscosity would increase rapidly. 
But if we cool it slowly so it can crystallize along the way, then we get a bunch of intermediate behavior depending on what the cooling rate is. And if we cool it really slowly, like a pluton, then it will ha always have the equilibrium crystal fraction. And actually, the viscosity increases very quickly um, at a much higher temperature. All right, lots of things to think about. Let's look at some rocks. So uh, here's a talk I gave um, a couple of years ago. Um, and we're starting with the, the low temperature, what I'm going to call brittle lava, which probably sounds a little oxymoronic. Um, maybe it is. Um, this is strictly for uh, the Brits in the audience. But anyway, that's uh, some custard. And the, the um, you can all enjoy custard. It's fine, uh, wherever you're from. So um, it's actually a Polish recipe. I didn't, didn't know custard was big in Poland. Um, but Obsidian Dome in Eastern California is you know, a, a fairly classic example of a silicic lava dome that has these things that kind of look like folds, right? Called ogives. Uh, you can see these sweeping around, especially on the south and, and east side. Um, and the idea is that these are kind of folds. Sometimes you hear them referred to as flow folds. And the idea is that this is like the skin of the, of the flow. It's a bit like the skin on custard, right? At least the custard I used to have at school. Um, however, our views of silicic lava emplacement are changing. So um, we have lots of examples of simultaneous effusive and more explosive activity. So there have been two recent rhyolite eruptions that really changed our views. So Cordoncoye and Chaitan, both in, in Chile, both in the last 15 years. Um, this is Santiago in Guatemala, so this is a day site. Um, but this is a lava flow actually down here. Uh, you can see the levees picked out by the shadows. A, a huge lava flow. We'll see that again later on. Uh, and then this is the active conduit, but it's both producing lava, feeding this flow, and a few times a day it does this. Uh, There's a better view of the lava flow. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the conduit. And then the lava flow comes down here, and it's this big ridge. These are levees, comes down, turns the corner. Anyway, so um, we know that effusive and, and explosive activity can happen simultaneously. Um, this is South Cule in California, part of the Mono Inyo chain, so related to Obsidian Dome, but a bit bigger. This erupted on top of a hill and then kind of splurged out, so it's what we call a Cule, which is just French for flow, actually. And here it is, um, the aerial view from Google Maps, but you can see this central and there's kind of a, a side lobe here, but the central channel with these ogives, what are often referred to as flow folds, and the idea is that that is basically just a really big version of the hoi hoi, and it's been modeled that way. However, I would argue that um, this is not a good way to model these lavas. This is what a natural cross section of the hoi hoi looks like. It's just the skin on the hoi hoi that gets folded up and, and ropey. So instead, we have a different view. And so the prevailing view is that these features are folds that result from ductile deformation in compression. So the only changes we want to make to that model are that it's in fact brittle, not ductile, and that it's in extension. All right, so what, why? Uh, so here, let's go to uh, Newbury uh, in Oregon. And so here's the interlake flow that came from this vent area, flows down, butted up against the central pumice cone, and then split into two flows. All right, if, this, if these features are a result of compression, you would expect the ogives to be most pronounced where that flow is coming down the hill and butting up against the pumice cone. They're not there. The ogives instead are further down where the lava is really stretching and thinning and spreading out down the slope in extension. Furthermore, when you look inside these, uh, these things, um, there are, I'll show you some pictures later on, th th these flows often have these big cracks in them that sometimes you can get into and you can look at the interior of the flow and they all have flow folding, flow banding going on. When you look at that flow folding, you can map it, and it looks something like this. You, you never see the base of the, the trough of the ogive. This is another thing. They actually come down, they're really, they seem to be pretty acute, but they're always full of talus. 
whereas the top end is usually pretty rounded. Um, but they have these flow bands that, that are basically sub-parallel to the surface. So if you restore that, assuming that these are the product of folding, and you stretch this out to the horizontal, you get upright isoclinal folds, which makes no sense in the context of these lavas being erupted onto the surface. However, if you think that maybe this is a crack, and then you restore it by simply closing the crack, you get these recumbent isoclinal folds, which in some places in lava flows where you've had erosion um, and you can see the flow interior, you see a lot of recumbent isoclinal folding. So our argument then is that these are brittle and extensional. I neglected to show you where Obsidian Dome is. There it is, just north of Long Valley Caldera. Let's go to the top of Obsidian Dome and look around. Brittle deformation is everywhere. Right? So the top of Obsidian Dome is just covered in talus and breccia. And one memorable day when we were out there, Oscar Isaac and Ben Affleck. But we didn't get to meet them. Security wouldn't let us on there. Anyway, if you ever get to see a Netflix movie called Triple Frontier, it has some beautiful shots of Obsidian Dome. And a couple of beautiful shots of Oscar Isaac, but that's a whole other thing. Um, all right. So, um, yeah. So we've got this brittle deformation everywhere, right? Um, we have these, these towers, these seracs, and these, what we're calling here, clefts. This is Graham Andrews. I think that's Shelby, uh, his PhD student. Um, the, some of these pictures are from a paper that Shelby published this year. Um, anyway, um, where you see these, th these towers, they have these kind of curved, what look like fracture surfaces that, that define them. Um, and then you know, Shelby painstakingly classified all these different fractures at different scales, cracks, and then clefts, and then crevasses. And it's kind of telling that the original papers by the m leading proponent of the flow folding theory, which is John Fink um, of Arizona State, now mostly at Portland State. In his 1980 paper, he wrote, crevasses formed due to thermal contraction during cooling of the surface radial expansion near the outer margin of the advancing flow. So, extension. Uh, there are places where we see these uh, leathery and uh, uh, we call the, the red leather texture, this very oxidized kind of surface that, that cracks would have on them. And we often find these fragments of, uh, of tephra plastered to them. And it, it's a shame that um, Jim Gardner couldn't, couldn't be here today. But anyway, Jim, I'm sure, will tell you lots about sintering and welding of uh, fragments of ash and pumice uh, to hot, hot lava walls. Um, we have in some places, you know, breaches and everything. But, you know, these are cracks that opened up and then, uh, and they were very hot, obviously, because after the crack opened, stuff could still weld to the wall. In some places we have brittle ductile fracturing, right? So we, uh, this kind of rhythmic banding, this is where you had a crack uh, that opened quickly, and then it kind of sagged open, so it's right around the glass transition, it's alternating between brittle and ductile behavior. Uh, and these have been seen in many other places, some obsidians in, in uh, Iceland, but not only in obsidians. This is a day site at Larsen. This is a crystal rich day site. And here we're looking into a crack, and these stripes are these same bands, like this, repeating, going in and into the side of the mountain. Um, and then the biggest ones of all are called crease structures, uh, which you can fit two grad students inside quite easily. Um, and again, uh, Anderson and Fink described this as crease structures form and the lava flow is forced to spread laterally, extending. Um, anyway. uh, this, by the way, is one of these recumbent isoclinal folds that we saw deep inside one of the, the crease structures. Uh, the odives of Obsidian Dome, they're mostly on the south and the east. You don't see them in the, in the north and the west. So this is basically uphill and this is downhill. You see the odives where the flow is extending and splurging downhill, not where it's erupting from the vent and then being squeezed against the hillside. Anyway, crease structures um, and this, uh, and my, my contention is this kind of um, brittle lava emplacement is actually common in a wide range of lavas. So pictures here on the top left, that's uh, Obsidian Dome. 
Um, this is uh, Mount St. Helens. Um, yeah, pretty cool seeing this thing come out of the ground, but this big split right here is all these cracks. Um, C and D, these are basaltic andesites. So this is one in, in Chile, a place we started working recently. Uh, this is um, uh, oh, this one is SP Crater in Arizona, which some of you will know. Um, anyway, all right. So where am I going with this? Um, let's let's go to Chile and look a, a little bit more at uh, these things. So on the same scale, here's Obsidian Dome in California. Here is the Tocopuri Dome in in Chile, right up close to the Bolivian border, about five thousand meters elevation. Uh, for me, very hard work to climb up and down. Here's a picture of it, and it's, it's quite a, a sizable cliff. Anyway, so a very steep-sided dome, um, quite close to circular. It's obviously not circular, but it's much more circular than most kind of lava flows. Um, the other side of it, um, this corner in the southeast, we can see uh, an intact upper half, and then this very discrete shear zone, and this is a basal bracha here. Um, which is all actually welded and stuck together again. Um, but again, we have abundant evidence for um, lots and lots of brittle deformation, which I won't, won't go into anymore. But this on the left is the Chow Day site, which is a, a, another Kool Aid. This is huge, it's really thick lava flow. This flow front right here is 400 meters high. Um, this thing is an absolute monster. Um, so this is what it looks like in hand specimen, right? Does that look like lava or does that look like a countertop? You know, it's like, it's really crystal rich. Now, when you look in thin section, there's actually about 20% glass in there. Um, but it's, it, I couldn't see it in the outcrop. Um, anyway, so very, very crystal rich. So these, these very, very viscous things. All right, why am I showing you these? Because these are the closest analogs that I know of on Earth to the pancake domes on Venus. And so this is my current student, Lauren, is, is working on this. Unfortunately, um, we can't do field work on these just yet, so we'll go to these instead. Um, now, there's a few differences, right? The scale difference is pretty big. These are really circular. Um, you know, had discussions earlier today where, yeah, of course, there are some oddities about these, like the, the overlapping, like these things don't overlap each other. So I'm not entirely sure what's going on, but we don't know what the pancake domes are made of. Right? Are they made of basalt? Are they made of something silica rich? We know they have steep sides that are about a kilometer high. Um, and when people hear steep sides, they go, oh, right, high, high viscosity silicic. Maybe it's a crystal rich basalt. We don't know. All right, so um, let's talk about some very different lavas here. And now for something completely different. Non-silicate lavas and cryolavas. So um, this is work by uh, Aaron Morrison, who was a PhD student with me at Mizzou and then UTSA and then postdoc briefly, and now he works for Corning in upstate New York, making better iPhone screens or something. He can't tell me what he works on, but anyway, it sounds cool. Um, so log viscosity, inverse temperature. Oh. All right, sorry, I thought I'd put the real temperature on there in a way we could read it, but I didn't, never mind. Um, Right, basalts. So here we've got um, a Hawaii lavas in our viscometer above the liquidus and then below the liquidus as they start to crystallize. Uh, carbonatites are kind of actually, they're more fluid, but not that much more fluid, factor of 10 to 100 maybe. These are brines. This is water methanol, water ammonia, water methanol, ammonia. And the reason that the reason people like to stick methanol and ammonia in their, in their cryolava is it massively reduces the eutectic temperature uh, and the, the freezing point. Actual water is limited to right around here. Actual water has a viscosity of around one millipascal second. So again, now we're going you know, from 10 to the minus three up to maybe 10 to the plus three pascal seconds. Um, so, the, these are all data that were available before Aaron started his project, and the question really was, uh, what is the viscosity of different brines that we might have, say, on Europa? And what kind of features would we expect? Because this is a cryo, well, <coughs> this is a feature on Europa that is widely ascribed to cryovolcanism, called the mitten. Um, 
Obviously, it's a very different scale, 50 kilometers, rather than Obsidian Dome, uh, again. Uh, but superficially, it kind of resembles. This is SP Crater, uh, should you picked it from before, in northern Arizona. Uh, and this is a lava flow on Titan. Um, and then this is over the uh, Sharon uh, on the left. So we have these things that look like they might be volcanic constructs with this brown kind of flood plane, except it will be a cryo lava plane um, filling and covering them partly. Just as the Lunar Mare, shown in the dark red here, covers, uh, partly covers a lot of uh, volcanic features on the moon. All right, so going to Europa, another question, why is it called cryo lava? Like, why not just call it space seawater, which is always already much cooler than regular seawater. Um, but it's because when it erupts, it's not stable at the surface, right? So our oceans, okay, there's a bit of freezing at the poles and there's a bit of evaporation, especially around the equator, uh, but generally water is pretty stable at Earth's surface. Not so on Europa, right? So when, whenever this stuff uh, erupts, it, it will freeze and will go through crystallization much like a, a silicate lava, only differently. All right, so we used a, a slightly different rheometer that I'm not going to talk about for this one. But um, anyway, we did it. Well, Aaron did a whole bunch of e experiments. Uh, we looked at NaCl, KCl, ammonium chloride, various sulfates. And the key thing here is to note what the range of viscosity is. So first of all, the units here are now all millipascal seconds. Water coming out of your tap is one millipascal second. And so we're looking at a range of, you know, for these brines, probably between about 3 and 20 millipascal seconds, um, going from ambient temperature down to the eutectic temperature, which for most of them is around minus 20-something uh, degrees C. So we have a range now of maybe a factor of 6 for the liquids. Um, Simple brines, uh, yeah, span that viscosity range. If we try mixing electrolytes, so here's a sodium chloride magnesium sulfate, which is kind of the go-to, um, you know, first, first attempt at Europa's ocean, and we can do different combinations of salinity. Um, we're actually with, at a narrower range than that 3 to 20 millipascal range. Um, if we add in, you know, methanol and ammonia, we can mix them. Um, although that would extend the, the potential temperature range at which they're still molten to much lower temperatures, um, I can't reach them in my viscometer. Um, but also the actual effect on the viscosity, that they're very much within the range of the, the other electrolytes, so we could potentially just project down temperature. All right, so one thing Aaron did was a whole bunch of measurements, but then also some models. So cryolava flow and placement, we, em we envisage water, brine, cryolava coming out of the ground, is it coming out of a fissure, is it coming out of a, circuit, uh, a cylindrical conduit like we often imagine for terrestrial volcanoes? We don't know. So we did a one-dimensional model where we start with cryolava at the surface, um, probably close to uh, zero degrees C, but moving across the surface. Um, it's going to be really turbulent to begin with. Um, it's also going to be evaporating. It's going to start crystallizing. And sooner or later, the effect of the crystals in there is going to make it more and more viscous. It's going to find it harder to stay turbulent. And at some point, it's going to transition to being laminar. All right. So when that happens, um, the model we're going to use no longer applies because we're assuming turbulent flow for a bunch of calculations. But also, probably something, you know, something dramatic is going to happen at that transition. For a start, once you get laminar flow, the ice crystals can all float to the surface and form a roof very quickly. In turbulent flow, those ice crystals are going to be entrained. So we looked at all these different um, fluxes and hopefully added them up in the correct order. Um, and, uh, and then put that into one dimensional model. We used Excel, because I guess I'm getting old. Anyway, I like Excel. I understand it. <laughs> anyway, um, but um, anyway, relatively, you know, it's a relatively simple model. There's, of course, a lot of equations to put in there. Let's look at some output. All right. So, on the left, uh, this is actually log of the Reynolds number versus the love 
flow thickness, but what this tells us basically is are we looking at turbulent or laminar flow? So most cryolavas are going to be turbulent when they, when they erupt, because they're going to have viscosities that are fairly low, right? Especially if they've got no crystals in them, they're likely to be in this range. And so whatever their thickness, and yeah, this seems like a ridiculously large range of thickness, but does anybody know how thick a cryolava flow would be at the vent? So we kind of picked, we think it's probably in this range, but just to cover our bases, we went an order of magnitude lower and higher than we thought was probably reasonable. Uh, and then you can calculate you know, the Stokes number and see should, uh, should ice crystals float um, or be constantly entrained in the turbulent flow. And of course it depends on the size of the ice crystals, but generally they will entrain ice. Okay, so this one's a little hard to explain, but basically, um, each of these is um, each of these lines tells you about a heat flux, and the lines stop whenever the turbulent to laminar transition was reached. So the end of the line means that's the end of the flow, and the reason that there are so many different lines on there is we have um, 100 meter thick flow, 10 meter thick flow, one meter thick flow, and we have it for different salinities on the different rows. And then we have a base condition, one with high erodibility of the substrate and one with a, a steep slope. And obviously, if you've got a slope of one degree, you can't actually have a lava flow that's like hundreds of kilometers long with a slope of one degree because you need actually quite a bit of topography to make, make that physically possible and that doesn't exist on your own. Anyway, um, the key thing here is the, the number one flux, uh, the heat loss mechanism is evaporation. This is very different to terrestrial lavas, right? They typically do not evaporate. Um, frictional heating, actually from, because they're moving so fast, you, actually, you can produce, you convert kinetic energy to thermal energy. Um, next time you're you know, in somebody else's house, get a spoon and bend it back and forth real quick. You'll find that where you bent it, it's warm. Um, and uh, okay, so that's in a solid, but there's an analogous thing happens if you stir liquids really hard. Um, anyway, radiative losses are really low. So again, this is very different to terrestrial lavas, which erupt at high temperatures. These things are erupting, best case, at about zero degrees C, right? Radiative heat loss goes as uh, T to the four. They're not really radiating much heat. Conditions at the turbulent laminar transition, um, so flows um, you know, up to 100 meters thick can travel uh, kilometers to maybe thousands of kilometers. But again, I think the 100 meter thick flow is a little optimistic. Um, but the kind of ve velocities we get are a few meters per second. When it finally transitions to lamina, the viscosity is a few hundred to maybe uh, a few thousand pascal seconds. It's maybe got 50 to 70 percent crystals. Most of those values, if you didn't know that that was a cryolava, if I told you it was a basalt, you go, okay, that sounds reasonable. So should we be looking for basaltic landforms in order to identify cryolavas on Europa? Um, anyway, that's a little summary of that. Um, and then of course we have no idea what happens after the turbulent to laminar transition because Aaron selfishly defended his thesis and went off and got a job. Um, instead of you know doing the logical next step, which would have been the cryolava tube model that we talked about, but never never actually implemented. So anyway, all right. So um, all right, let's talk about more different kinds of uh, of lava. So lunar lavas. So when I moved to San Antonio, I got more heavily into the planetary stuff than I had been before, but in one particular direction which is I got really interested in lunar simulants. There's a little startup company in San Antonio that we got a little bit of NASA funding together and they're basically trying to figure out how to melt lunar regolith and print, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, landing pads for rockets and then ultimately maybe, you know, uh, habitats as well. So, you know, the old standby is JSC-1. Right, Johnson Space Center 1, trusty lunar simulant, replicates the lunar mare. JSC 1 is from a cinder cone outside of Flagstaff, Arizona. Right? It is, I mean, it's a simulant. It's 
possibly not a great one. Anyway, but then that got me thinking more and more about you know, what would be a good simulum. Actually, we've, we've done quite a lot of work on that, which I'm not really going to talk about much. Um, but then that also led to other considerations. And so this is actually the first thing Aaron did in this PhD was um, we were involved in a project looking at um, impact melts. So when a big asteroid impacts the moon or you know, most other bodies, uh, it's going to, um, first of all, the impactor is generally going to um, vaporize. Um, the top surface of the target is generally going to vaporize. And a bunch of stuff deeper down is going to be melted. And the thing is, it's whatever there is what melts. We're not partially melting the mantle or anything here. We're just melting whatever got hit. All right. And so um, we can also look at very different temperature conditions. Cubic zirconia has been found, which actually strongly implies, pretty much requires, this impact melt sheet in Canada to have at least briefly been at a temperature in excess of 2,370 degrees C. We just extend the temperature range of molten silicate flowing across the Earth's surface by 1,000 degrees C. Right? It just has to, has to be an impact melt. Um, impact melts, here's some. This is a Moldavite and a Philippinite. These are two different tektites that I got off pictures from, from Mindat. Um, what are tektites? They're bits of impact melt you know, um, that, that rain down little fiery droplets from the sky. Uh, but what are they made of? They're typically around 70% SiO2. Not because they're produced by partial melting of the crust or extensive fractional crystallization of the basalt. If you dug up, you know, the upper few hundred meters or a couple of kilometers of wherever the asteroid hit, that was its bulk composition. And there it is. It's all melted into that little green, green glassy blob. All right, so we're kind of looking at doing this on the moon with um, not with giant impacts, of course, but melting things on the surface. Um, this being kind of the ultimate end goal, I suppose. Um, and so if we're going to build infrastructure on the moon, we want to do as much of it as we can using lunar materials, because it is expensive in terms of energy to get it up the gravity well from Earth to the moon. Um, so um, there are two M members of material on the lunar surface. This is oversimplifying a little bit, but broadly, you've got the basaltic mare, right, which are the darker areas, and then we've got the reflective light-colored highlands that are mostly made of feldspar. Um, these things have been at the moon's surface for a very long time, and micrometeorites have actually um, transformed a lot of them to glass. You get these weird things called agglutinates that are these tiny, like, tens of micron sized impact melts. Because remember, the moon has no atmosphere. We don't get those on Earth um, because they burn up in our atmosphere and we go, oh, shooting star, and there it is. Uh, but on the moon, it's coming in at you know, whatever velocity it's at. It's not slowing down until it hits the, uh, hits the regolith. All right, so we did a bunch of experiments mixing a northazite and, yes, JSC1A. We were still learning. We've done other simulants since then. Um, anyway, but there's our proxies for the highlands and the mare. Um, what we did was we took some powder and then um, we remelted it and made some glass and then we used either all powder or all glass or mixtures and then we mixed together the anorthosite and the, and the mare and we put them in our calorimeter and heated them up and measured the heat capacity which I know is the most boring thing except it turns out it's not, right? So heat capacity generally doesn't change very much. It's a little different with composition. It increases with temperature, but generally doesn't do that much. But if you measure it in a calorimeter, look how exciting that is. Right, so what's going on? Um, so actual heat capacity of our starting material is this. The glassy part goes through the glass transition right here. There's a little jump. It's the configurational heat capacity. As you keep heating, that now super cooled liquid realizes I should be crystallizing, uh, and I do anthropomorphize my samples much more than I should, but anyway, it crystallizes, that is exothermic, and then we melt it, that is endothermic, and so the area, this area in here is the energy released during crystallization, this area here is the energy required to melt. They're very different because here, just 
We only had some glass in the sample that crystallized, and here we had to melt all of the crystals, both the ones that were there to begin with and the ones um, that grew. All right, so um, the, the cliff notes here is that um, glassy materials release energy when you heat them up, which if you're trying to get to a high temperature, saves you energy, right? The enthalpy of melting is lower if you start the glassy material. Um, it's easier to stick the salt together and form bricks uh, at a lower temperature than the highlands. Um, right, the sintering to form a brick, right? So basically just undergoing that lower temperature crystallization rather than completely remelting and then forming a brick and cooling um, uses a lot less energy. So skipping ahead, the lunar regolith and the small size fractions are glassier. And so actually, if you want to make bricks on the moon using the least energy possible, you should sieve the regolith, take the small size fraction, it's going to be glassiest, and that'll help you make bricks um, as cheaply as possible. All right, so we'll skip over uh, some crystallization stuff here. Um, all right, I'm just going to show you this. This is our lava in a crucible. It's cooling. It's about to crystallize, and off it goes. This is this is coded for temperature. This is obviously not a visible image. This is just color coded on with the FLIR camera. So what's happening there? Why were the crystals hotter than the liquid? It's because the crystals are releasing latent heat. And so actually, what happens is we can make lava spontaneously heat up by uh, about 200 degrees um, by cooling it at just the right rate and getting it to crystallize really quickly, which is of possible relevance to Io. You can ask me questions about it, but I've taken enough of your time. So I'm going to end with future directions. So yeah, there's a bunch of rheology stuff we need to do. Um, two, two ideas though, the cryolavas on Europa at the point where they transition from turbulent to, to lamina. They have very similar rheological properties and have moved similar distances at similar speeds to basaltic lavas on Earth. So are we looking for the right landforms? Um, and then perhaps the biggest question is, what other compositions are out there in all the exoplanets and exoplanetary moons, bearing in mind that they can produce their own through endogenic igneous processes, or they can produce them by impact melting? So we can have metallic lavas, we can, we can have all kinds of stuff. And I'll end with that. Thank you.